Good evening. I'm very honored to be with you in Kuwait and very honored to have people sponsor us and uh, make this a, an evening of leadership and, and learning how to grow and develop as a leader. And I'm just looking forward to our time together. And if it's okay, while I teach, I'll sit. And the reason that I like to sit is because although this will be a teaching, it's also a conversation. The best way to connect and communicate with people is by uh, sitting with them, uh, usually eating, <laughs> and, and mostly just getting to really know each other. And that's what I want to do now. I, wanna, I, want to, um, I want to meet you. You look very smart. You, you look um, happy, and uh, I want to just find out who you are. My, my name is John, and on the count of three, I'd like you to give me your name. One, two, three. Nice to meet you. My wife, Margaret, and I have been married for 45 years. We have two children. We have five grandchildren. And um, grandchildren are just amazing, okay? They're just, they're just amazing. Um, we have an expression in the state, a fun expression, that says grandchildren are God's gift to you for not killing your children. You just let your children live, and, and they give you grandchildren. How, how many, how many um, would, would be grandparents here? If you're a grandparent, would you raise your hand? Oh, we, a few, huh? Grandparents? Okay. Well, trust me. If you have grandchildren, you hold the, that baby and that first grandchild in your arm, and, and you just say to yourself, this is the most beautiful, intelligent baby ever born. No one has to tell you. You just know. And then you, and then you ask a question. You look at this grandchild, this grandbaby, and you ask the question, why did intelligence skip a generation? <laughs> I was, um, I told that story at a large convention, and, and I forgot that my son Joel was in the audience. And so when I was done speaking, I went to the green room, and he was there waiting for me. And, and when I saw him, I said, now, Joel, I was just kidding, you know, a joke about intelligence skipping a generation. He said, it's okay, Dad, it's okay. In fact, he said, I think you're, I think you're right. I said, you do? He said, yes. He said, I think you're right. He said, just last week, Grandpa and I had that very same discussion. <laughs> I'm very honored uh, to teach and share with you today. And what I'll do is I'm, I'm going to teach for a, a period of time on leadership about 7 o'clock. We'll take a break. And then when we come back in, I'll finish my lecture on the five levels of leadership. And then I'll answer questions and, and we'll do a little bit of Q&A. But I'm just delighted to, to, to be with you. Um, can I have a bottle of water? Is that okay? Just, oh, thank you. Th thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. My name's John. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I can tell already you're a man of action. You know, brought the water to me. Leadership is the love of my life and it's my passion. And it's the love of my life, and it's my passion because I know what happens when people learn to lead well, when people learn to lead better. I, I see total life change happen in, in people's lives, in the communities, in their, uh, in their companies. I know that I'm speaking mainly to bankers. 
And, and I understand um, I understand banking pretty well. Uh, my brother and I own some banks in uh, in the states. And um, when when people learn to lead, it's amazing how more effective they become. So I'm ready to teach, and and are you ready to um, uh, are you ready to learn? Are you ready? Look at your neighbor, the person you're seated beside, and say to them, you're going to learn something. Go ahead and tell them that. Good. Now, look right back at them and say, that's why I brought you here. That's why I brought you here. I wrote a book I wrote a book uh, about 12 years ago called The 21 Laws of Leadership, okay? And, and I, want to, I want to begin my teaching this evening by talking to you and teaching you two of those laws, okay? Um, do you have an iPad or paper or anything to take notes on? Uh, because uh, I promise you I'm going to teach you some things that, that will add value to you. So let, let, let's go. The first law of leadership in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is the law of the LID, L-I-D. And the law of the LID says how well you lead determines how well you succeed. This is an amazing law. Now, when I wrote the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership 12 years ago, I had no idea that it would be the best-selling leadership book ever written. It has sold millions of copies. It sold over a million copies in China alone. It's the number one leadership book in the world. And the law of the lid is so important for all of us to understand and apply if we're going to be successful in our business. Let me, let me illustrate, let me explain. If this hand represents how well I lead, this is, this is John Maxwell's leadership lid right here. This is my leadership capacity. This is, this is how well I lead. This is my leadership lid. Now, if this is how well I lead, this is my leadership lid, and this hand represents my business, my bank, here's what I know. Here's what I know is true in Kuwait, it's true in the United States, it's true in every country. If this is how well I lead, my leadership lead, and this is my business, my bank, my organization, my company, okay? What the law of the lid teaches is this, that my business will rise up to but never go higher than my leadership lid that my leadership puts a lid on my organization. And whatever that is, it determines how successful I'll be. So, let's say, um, let's say I'm an average leader. So, from a 1 to a 10, my leadership is a 5. I'm average. If my leadership lid is a five, that's how well John Maxwell leads, then what that means is my business will be a four. It won't rise any higher. It will not become a six or a seven or an eight. No. My business cannot rise any higher than my ability to lead people. Now, I speak at the great universities of the world. I did the opening session for the United Nations. I speak at West Point. And I can tell you for a fact, history proves, regardless of the country or regardless of the culture, everything rises and falls on leadership. And history proves that you nor I can build our business beyond our ability to lead. Now, 
That's an amazing statement. People ask me all the time. I do mentoring for um, Microsoft. In fact, the CEO of Microsoft, I've, I've mentored for 20 years. I do mentoring for Delta Airlines and the biggest companies in America. And, and people come to me all the time and they'll say, John, how do I grow my company? How do I grow my organization? Very simple. Grow your leaders. The more leaders you have in your company and the better leaders that you have in your company will determine the success of your company. That's a fact. In the history of the world, not one time has a government, a company, education, not one time have any of those entities been able to bypass, go above, and keep growing when the leadership level stays the same. That's a fact. So what that means to me, what that means to you, what it means to all of us in this room today is that the better we learn to lead and the better leader that we become, the more potential we have of growing and developing our companies. When I do question and answer, one of the most popular questions people ask me is somebody will raise their hand and they'll say, John, are leaders born? And whenever they ask me, are leaders born, I always give them the same answer. Of course they are. Think about that question. I've never met an unborn leader. <laughs> Don't particularly want to either. Thank you very much. You see, when they ask, are leaders born, they're not asking, like, were they born? What they're asking is, are there some people when they're born, they have kind of a natural leadership ability, and, and so they go to the front of the line, and some people don't have that ability, so they go to the back of the line. And, and the great news that I want to share with you today is that there are people that have leadership tendencies and, and leanings. That's, that's a fact. But, but that every person can learn to lead. Leadership can be taught. Leadership can be learned. And, and I know that. I have the largest leadership training organization in the world. We have trained leaders in every nation, and we've trained six million leaders. In fact, it was my privilege before I, I came up to speak this evening uh, to, to meet a wonderful young lady who has just been trained in our coaching company, the John Maxwell team. We, we have coaches around the world that, that, that we train to speak and to lead and teach. And so when it comes to equipping and training, I understand it very well. And you and I can learn to lead. So. I want you to look at your neighbor, the person you're seated beside, and say to them with a smile, even you can learn to lead. Go ahead and tell them that. Even you. Okay. So if my leadership lid from a 1 to a 10 is a 5, I'm average, okay? From a 1 to a 10, it's a 5. If that's my leadership lid, that means my organization or my company is a 4. And it cannot go any higher unless I increase and raise my leadership lid. And I can do that. In other words, it's possible to take your leadership lid from a 5 to a 6 to a 7. Maybe, maybe you couldn't get to an eight. Now, the moment that you and I raise our leadership lid, we now have growth for our company to go from a four to a five to a six to a seven. Our organization will fill the gap or the vacancy once we raise the leadership lid. 
everything rises and falls on leadership. The moment that we truly understand that, and then the moment that we truly realize that we can become a better leader, that we can grow, that we can learn leadership, things begin to be amazing. When I was in my late 20s, I heard a, a speaker say one time that if you'll spend one hour a day, every day, for five years on a specific subject, in five years, you could become an expert on that subject. And I could remember saying to myself, I'm going to do that. I'm going to spend an hour every day learning leadership, talking to the leaders, reading leadership books, going to leadership forums like this. I'm going to commit myself every day to learn how to lead. Now, that was 40 years ago. I still every day practice leadership, learn leadership, talk to leaders, and study leadership because I've learned that the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And so what happens is when you begin to increase capacity, something beautiful happens. Capacity increases. And we begin to be much better, much bigger, much more effective than we would ever have thought possible. So, the law of the lid is a very important lid to help us understand that how well we lead determines how well we will succeed. Now, let me share with you a second law that I want to give that's just as important as the law of the lid. And by the way, the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is in 47 languages. It's been taught in every country. And the word laws are important because the 21 Laws of Leadership aren't thoughts or principles or good ideas. They're laws. In other words, they work. And to make sure that they work, for two years we tested them. We tested them based on gender, on culture, based on time. In other words, these 21 laws would work 500 years ago. These 21 laws would have worked 1,000 years ago. The, in other words, they're, they're, they, they rise above time. They rise above culture. In fact, I can still remember doing a, a, a major teaching on the 21 laws of leadership. And during a break, I was signing books. And, and a, a gentleman came up to me with my book, and, and so I started to sign it. And he said, uh, I've read the 21 Laws of Leadership, and I disagree with one of your laws. And I smiled, and I said, that's okay. And started to sign his book, and he stopped me. He said, no, no. He said, you, you didn't hear me. He said, I've read your 21 Laws of Leadership, and I disagree with one of your laws. And I smiled again. I said, I heard you. It's okay. And I signed the book. I handed it back to him, but he didn't move. Stayed right there. He said, I, I, still, I don't think you have heard me yet. I don't agree with one of your laws. And I said, I hear you. It's okay. It's okay. I smiled at him and I said, I, I didn't write the book to make you happy. I wrote the book to help you. I'm a leader, not a clown. And I don't care whether you like the law or not. That's like a person say to me, John, I, I disagree with the law of gravity. I don't care. But I'll tell you what, go to a four-story building, jump off the top, you'll buy into the law of gravity. You see, the laws don't care whether you like them or not. They don't even care whether you obey them. They're the laws. And the laws of leadership, regardless of time, regardless of culture, regardless of gender, they just work. And one of the laws of leadership that I want to talk to you about is the law of process. 
And the law of process says leaders develop daily, not in a day. This incredible leadership law says it takes time to learn how to lead, that it takes time to become a good leader, that, that it's not something you do immediately or quickly. It's, 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 it's not something that you become after you read one book or, or you come to one event. Often people will come to hear me speak on leadership and they'll, they'll come up to me and they'll shake my hand. They'll say, I'm so excited. I'm going to hear you talk on leadership and today I'm going to become a leader. And I said, no, 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 you're not. Now, today you may begin your leadership journey, but, but, but you're not going to become a leader in one session or reading one book. You're not that good, nor am I that good. It takes time. It's a process. And so, as we think of leadership, what we need to do is understand that today we begin the journey. And as we begin the journey today, what we also need to understand is that it's a process. In other words, it will take time to develop great leadership skills. I've been writing leadership books. In fact, I've written over 80 books. In fact, I've written more material on leadership than any man that's ever lived. And yet, I'm still learning how to lead. I'm still growing as a leader. So look at the person you're sitting beside and say to them, it's going to take you a while to be a great leader. Go ahead and tell them. It's going to take you a while. Okay? Sure. In fact, look right back at them and say, for you, it may take a real long while. Okay? <laughs> this, may, this, this may be a long, long process. Now, everywhere I go, whether it's companies, governments, educational institutions, health companies, regardless of where I go, people want to develop leaders. In fact, people call me in all the time and say, we want you to teach us leadership. We want you to, we, we need better leaders, we need more leaders. The teaching leadership is always in high demand. This is the last stop of an international tour that eight days ago I started in Namibia, Africa, and South Africa, and, 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 and making my way through, and, and, and tomorrow I, I go home. But regardless of the country, regardless of, of what kind of a company, they always want more, they need more, more and better leaders. And, and, and so they'll say, John, can you help us develop great leaders fast? Can't do it. It's impossible. It takes time. You see, too many times we try to microwave leaders. We, we put them in the, we get our company leadership microwave and, and, and we put our leaders in there and we push some numbers and then we zap them. And, and we hope that they'll come out as great leaders. It takes time. So to help us understand the process of leadership, this evening, I'm going to teach you the five levels of leadership because leadership is not one place, it's not one situation, it's not one position. There are five levels. And I have been teaching the five levels of leadership for 30 years. When I go to West Point, they want, us, want me to teach the five levels of leadership. When Delta Airlines eight years ago filed Chapter 11 and was financially in trouble, the president and CEO sat down with me and said, John, if you were leading this company, what would you do? And I said, very simply, you have an airline company, but you don't have a leadership culture. And because you don't have a leadership culture, you're not reaching your potential. And so, they brought in 3,500 of their employees around the world, and for a day, I taught them the five levels of leadership. 
I shared with him, if you want to develop a leadership culture, if you want to develop a, a company that really understands leadership, you've got to understand the five levels of leadership. By the way, what I'm about to teach this evening and share with you, if you understand and if you relate it and if you apply it to yourself and to your company, over time, you will develop a leadership culture. Listen carefully. Culture is much more important than vision. When leaders think of running and building a company, they think of vision. And they say, well, look, here's where we're going. And they, they cast this beautiful, clear vision of this is what we want to become. This is where we're going. That's vision. And that vision, with a beautiful picture and, 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 and shared well, becomes a catalyst. It becomes the fuel to, to help that company get there. But culture is much more important than vision. In fact, 100 to 1, culture is more important. Because culture is behavior. Culture isn't what we see. That's vision. Culture is what we do. And what we do and how we behave determines where we're going to go and what we're going to accomplish. And what I'm going to share with you with the five levels of leadership is a process of understanding how leadership works, and it's also helpful in developing a leadership culture for your banks, for your company, for your organization, for whatever you're leading. So, let's look at the five levels, and, and, and let's begin, okay? Now, the five levels of leadership, you can see here, we're going to begin in a moment with the lowest level, which is the position level, and we'll move from the position to the permission to the production to people development, and finally to level five, the top level, the pinnacle level. But we're going to begin with where we all start, the lowest level, the first level of leadership, and that is the position level of leadership. Now, at the position level of leadership, people follow us because they have to. So, at this level, the key word is rights. We have certain rights when we are a positional leader, and, and because of those privileges and rights, people follow us because they have to. When I'm interviewed by magazines and, and tele, on television, many times people come to me and they'll say, John, of all the things that you know about leadership, what is the, um, what is the biggest mistake that people make? And I always share with them the biggest mistake that people make is thinking that if they have a leadership position, that somehow that makes them a great leader. And what I want you to know is level one is where we all start. We get a title. We get a position. But level one leadership is not the highest level. It's the lowest. Again, when I go to West Point, the generals ask me to speak to all of the officers and all of the cadets on the five levels. And when they introduce me, the first thing they tell all those, all those people, all those, all those soldiers, all those cadets, the first thing they tell them is, John's going to teach you something totally different than what you believe. He's going to teach you that position's the lowest level. It's the starting level. Nothing wrong with it. But it's the beginning, not the end. Now, who's asking me to teach this? generals, leaders of armies, 
armies that have titles and armies that have position and rank, and you lead out of that position. But you see, those generals understand that although you may have a position of leadership, it's not the highest level. In fact, it's the first level. Now, we all start at level one. That's how I got started. That's probably how you got started. We get a, a job or we get a title or we get a position. And, and basically, because we have that title or position, we get to lead. What you have to know and understand is this. Just because you have a leadership position doesn't mean you're a good leader. I know many people, they have the position of a leader, but they're not a good leader. But because you have a position, people follow you because they have to. In other words, they have no choice. Now, if people follow you, and they have no choice. It's not because you're a good leader. It's because they have no choice. I have to follow them. That, that's how I get my paycheck. That's, that's how I keep my job. You never know. You never know if you're a good leader if the people that are following you have no choice. The position doesn't make the leader. The leader makes the position. And the number one challenge in my organization that trains around the world, the number one challenge we have is to go from country to country and culture to culture and help people see that yes, you can lead out of position, but it doesn't make you a good leader. If people have to follow you, you don't know if you're a good leader or not. So let's think about this for a little bit. I have people come to me and they'll say, um, John, I'm so excited. Um, I became a leader last week. And as soon as they tell me they became a leader last week, I know that they don't understand leadership. They didn't become a leader last week. Last week, they got a leadership position. And a position doesn't prove your leadership. I was doing an uh, all-day teaching to basically the top 100 companies in America, the CEOs. They were spending a day, and I was teaching them the 21 Laws of Leadership, and we were doing Q&A. And during a Q&A time, one of the uh, CEOs of one of the companies said, John, I have three people in my company that I'm thinking of promoting to a very high senior leadership position. And he said, they all seem to do really well as leaders, but I'm trying to figure out, of the three, who's the best leader? He said, do you have any suggestions? I said, yes. I said, have each three, those three people go out into their community and lead a volunteer project for six months. Have them go to some nonprofit organization and have them lead volunteers. And I said, in six months, you'll find out who your best leader is. Because here's what happens. When people don't have to follow you, you don't have title, you don't have position, you don't have rank. When people don't have to follow you, but want to follow you, now you're a good leader. And you never know if you're a good leader if you stay at level one. What you know is people have to follow you. So 
Are, are people behind you? Yes. Are people doing what you said? Yes. Are, are people doing what you requested? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Means nothing. They have no choice. That's not leadership. Leadership is the ability to influence people to follow you because you're a good leader. And the best leaders, people follow them not because they have to, they follow them because they want to. And there's a big difference between those two. Sometimes when I'm with a company, with executives, I'll look at them and I'll ask them this question. What's the one thing that you would change to make your company better? And I give them about three minutes, and they'll start writing things that they would do to make their company better. And then we'll talk about it. We'll just sit around a table, and, and I'll listen to them. Here's what's interesting. When I ask the question, what would you do to make your company better, only about 4% of the people respond correctly. 96% of them say good things, but not the most important thing. You see, when I ask, what would you do to, to make your company better, they'll say things like, well, I wish our people worked harder, or I wish they were more disciplined, or I wish they had a better attitude, or I wish they were a better team player. And they give me all those good things, but they miss the whole point. You see, if you want your company to be better, the first thing you do is not work on the people that you lead. You work on yourself. Very seldom do people say, if my company is going to get better, I have to get better. People ask me all the time, they'll say, John, what's your greatest leadership challenge? My greatest leadership challenge is leading me. That's my biggest challenge. It's not leading you. It's leading me. Because here's what I know. The leadership lit tells me that my people will only go as high as I can go. And, and whatever my leadership lit is, that's going to hold them all back. So instead of trying to fix down here, i got to fix this. And if I can get me better, and if I can grow, then my people can grow. Now, there's a tremendous upside with level number one. And the upside of level number one, the positive about it is once you get a leadership title and you get a leadership position, it gives you an opportunity to lead. So you get to try out your leadership skills. And it's the, of the five levels of leadership, it's the for me, it was my greatest area of growth. It was my greatest area of development. Now, here's what I want you to understand. If you think that leadership is position and title, you won't grow. I wrote a book in 1994 it's the second best-selling leadership book ever written, millions of copies, called Developing the Leader Within You. Peter Drucker, who was the great management expert for so many years, Peter Drucker told me, he said, John, this is the first book that basically has shared and told people that they can develop themselves as a leader. Up until this time, people thought that leadership was position and title. And so, you see, if I think that all I have to do is have a leadership position and that makes me a leader, I won't grow. I won't develop. I'll just hold on to my title. I'll hold on to my position. In fact, one of my favorite leadership proverbs is, he that thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. And I know all kind of people, they're taking walks. Okay.
If you're just a positional leader, there is a major negative. And let me give you what that negative is. If you are just a positional leader and you're not developing any more than the fact you have the power, you have the title, you have the position, I'm the boss. Okay, if that is where you are, let me tell you the downside of that leadership. When people follow me, when people follow you because they have to, they don't have any choice. Once they have figured out that they have no choice, that they have to follow you because you're the boss, you're the leader, you got the title. Once they understand that they have no choice, they make a decision. And here's their decision. At the moment they realize they have to follow you, they're not following you because you're a good leader. They're not following you because you're adding value to them. They're not following you. They're just, they have to follow you. Once they understand that, they begin to give you very little energy and effort. They begin to ask themselves this question, what's the least that I have to do to keep my job? What's the least I have to do to keep from being fired? And they begin, instead of giving you 100%, they begin to pull back and, and can I give them 80%? Oh, wow, I wonder if I could give 70%. Ooh, do you think, what, maybe, can I give 60%? And, and, and they'll keep pulling back, pulling back, and they'll withhold, they'll withhold energy, they'll, they'll withhold effort from you. That's a fact. They will do as little as possible. So, let, let's have some fun for a moment. Let, let me describe to you a level one leadership company. This is a company that leads out of title, out of position. Nobody has choices. They got to follow. Okay. If you are a level one company, let me tell you what I know about your people. If quitting time, when, when work is over, is 5 o'clock in the afternoon, if that's quitting time, about 4.30 in the afternoon, everybody's starting to clear their desk. They're, you know, clearing it all off. And, they're, they, and they're, you say, why are they clearing their desk? Well, they're clearing their desk because they're 30 minutes away from the most important time all day. They get a quit, and they can hardly wait to quit. When they went to work in the morning, their goal was to quit. The most important thing they thought about all day is five o'clock. Yes, five o'clock, free at last, free at last. So 4.30, they're clearing their desk. Why? Because when 5 o'clock comes, they don't want anything to impede the exit. They want to be able to go. They're done. At 4.45, they get up from their desk, and, and they're walking around the offices, and they're saying goodbye to everybody. <laughs> goodbye. Hey, hey, call me tonight. Give me a call. See you. Good to talk to you. T touch you later. Bye. At 4.50, they go to the restroom. They want to be sure to do that on company time. Mm -hmm. At, at 4.55, they're, they're back at their desk, but they're not back at their desk to work. No, 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 no. They're, they're putting on track shoes. And at 4.57, They're counting down. They th they're ready for the race. Ten, nine, eight, seven. And at five o'clock, they're gone. They're gone. It's a miracle. <laughs> you walk through the office and, and, and at 5.01 and you say, 
Where are they? Where did they go? In fact, you run to the window and look out at the parking lot. And when you run to the window, look out the parking lot, much to your surprise, you're seeing the last two cars peel out of the parking lot. How, how did they get out of the parking lot so fast? When they came in the morning, they took their cars and backed them into the space so they could be ready for a fast getaway. Now, we're having a little fun, but here's reality. If people only follow you because they have to, they will never give you their best. That's a fact. And who can build a great company? Who can build a great organization when people hold back their effort and energy? Who can build a great organization if people aren't giving you their best time and their best minds and their best hands and their best? It's impossible to build a great organization. It's impossible to, to build a great country. It's impossible to build anything of greatness with a lack of effort. And at level number one, if people follow you because they have to, they're just giving you as little as possible. Now, here's the good news. The good news is you don't have to stay at level one. You can go to level two. It's a choice. What's beautiful about leadership is you can grow as much as you want to. You can go as high as you want to. You see, leadership is a verb, not a noun. If leadership was a noun, all you would have to do is have a title or a position. But it's a verb. It means action. It means influence. It means the ability to take people from one point to another. So let's talk about level number two for a moment. The second level of leadership, the first level is the position level. The second level is the permission level. And I call it the permission level because level number two is based upon relationships. Level number two basically says that now people follow you not because they have to, they follow you because they want to. And there is a world of difference, a world of difference between people following you and me because they have to follow us and people following us because they want to follow us. There's a world of difference between those two. In fact, as you go up each level of leadership in this process of growth, every time you go to another level, there is a major positive plus influence and outcome that happens to you because you went to the next level. At level number one, it's the lowest level. And by the way, by the way, this level, this position level here, it's a wonderful place to start. It's a terrible place to stay. And what happens is leaders who think that leadership is position only, they stay right there. But to go from level one to level two and have people follow you, not because they have to, but have people follow you because they want to, here's where the big plus is. Here's where the big win is. At level two, people give you their energy. At level two, people give you their time. At level two, people begin to give you their heart. If you want 100% out of people, you have to have a connection with them. You have to have a relationship with them. Forty years ago, I made a statement that's quoted all the time. 
People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And level two is a relationship where you as a leader begin to connect with the people. And relationships, that's the foundation of leadership. Why? Because true leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. And how do you influence people? By connecting with them, by relating to them. Let me explain. If you're a positional leader, you think the people have to come to you. In fact, here's what positional leaders do and say all the time. There's an expression. Now, I, I, maybe it's not in Kuwait. I don't know. It's an it's a expression around many countries of the world, but maybe not in Kuwait. Let, in fact, I'll give you the expression, and then you tell me if, 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 it's, if it's said here, okay? Uh, it, but, but there's an expression that is given to leaders and leadership often, and the expression is, it's lonely at the top. Now, is that an expression that you get here? Maybe not. Okay. Okay. And it's, it's kind of the picture of the, of the leader up on top of the mountain, and all of his or her people are down at the bottom. And, and the leader's at the top, and he's looking down there, and he's saying, oh, my. Oh, my. Look at them. Look at them. Oh. Look at them. Oh. It's lonely at the top. A leader never said that. If you're at the top all alone, you're not a leader. No one's following you. If you're at the top all alone, you're not a leader. You're a hiker. You're, you're doing a hike. Because what do leaders do? When leaders see their people, if they're a level two permission leader, they don't wait for their people to come up to them. They don't wait for their people to connect to them. You see, if you're a level two leader, what you do is you get off the top yourself. And you walk down to where the people are. And you walk slowly through the crowd. And you understand as a leader, you need to connect with the people. Why do you need to connect with the people? Because you can't take people where they need to go until you find out where they are. So the first leadership responsibility is not to say to all the people, come to me, come to me. No, the leader goes to the people and connects with them. And then that leader, that leader then only takes people to the top as they're ready. And so, when I go back to the top, this time, I'm taking people with me. I'm connecting with them. I'm relating with them. I'm bringing them with me. In fact, leaders never cross the finish line first. If you want speed, don't lead. Just run by yourself. But leaders, they're known by the fact they take people with them. So when, when leaders cross the finish line, they, they bring people with them. It, it, they, they never say, I crossed the finish line. They said, we crossed the finish line. A few years ago when I did the opening session at the United Nations, and spoke to all the ambassadors of the world. They asked me to spend two hours teaching leadership. And so I, I kept asking myself, I've only had two hours to teach these world leaders about leadership. What should I teach? And so I went to New York City, and in that opening session, I shared with them what I'm going to share with you right now. I looked at all these leaders around the world, all the different countries, all the different cultures, and I said, let me say something. Wherever you lead and wherever you're from, when people follow you, they ask three questions. 
And these three questions are what I call the followers questions. And when they look at myself or when they look at you as leaders, there are three things they're asking themselves. Number one, do you care for me? Do you care for me? Who wants to follow a leader that doesn't care for a person, that doesn't value that person? Do you care for me? Question number two, can you help me? In other words, if I follow you, is it going to get better for me? It, it, am I going to go to a higher level or am I, going to, am I going to be able to do things I can't do? If I follow you, can, can you help me? Can you help me? That's question two. Question number three, can I trust you? If I follow you, are you going to lead with me in mind? Are you going to lead with my interest in mind? Can I trust you? Or, or are you going to manipulate me? Are, are you going to use me for your personal advantage? Three questions. Do you care for me? That talks about a leader's compassion. Can you help me? That talks about a leader's competence. Can I trust you? That's all about the character of the leader. Isn't it interesting, of those three questions, two of the three are all about level number two in leadership, relationships. Do you care for me? That's a relationship. Can I trust you? That's a relationship. Two of the three questions that followers ask leaders are all about level number two. So here's the question. How do we become an effective level two leader? Now what I want to do is I want to this evening on levels two, three, and four, I want to give you three things that if you do at these levels, it'll help you become effective at that level. Okay, so this, so this gets real, real practical, okay? Okay. And, and by the way, my name's John, and I'm your friend, okay? So, so look at your neighbor and say, John's your friend. Go ahead and tell them that. He, John's your friend, okay? I'm going to help you. At level number two, this relationship level, to be successful, you need to do three things well. Number one is listen. Listen. Level two leaders that are successful listen well. You say, wait a minute, John. I, I thought you were going to teach leadership. That's what I'm teaching. To be a great leader, you have to first be a great listener. And here's why. Leaders connect with their people. How do you connect with people? You don't connect with people by telling them where you are. You connect with people by finding out where they are. In fact, leaders at level number two, here's what they do. They listen, they learn, and then they lead. They listen, they learn, and 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 they lead. Great leaders get most of their leadership cues from listening. Now, this was a real weakness in my life as a young leader. 
I was full of energy and I was full of vision and I was constantly casting vision and, and getting people and recruiting people and saying, let's go. And, and I, was con I, was, I was constantly talking, teaching, leading, speaking, but I wasn't listening. It was all about get on my train and take my journey and come to my mountain. And I can remember very well a day where one of my key staff members very, very nicely, but with quite a bit of courage, came and said to me, John, you don't listen well. And I said, well, sure, I listen well. And I tried to cover it up, and, and she just smiled, and she said, trust me, you don't listen. In fact, I went home to my wife, Margaret, and I said, hey, you know, one of my staff said I didn't listen. What do you think? She said, I think she's right. <laughs> I don't think you listen very well. And all of a sudden, I saw a huge weakness in my leadership. You see, if you'll help people get what they want, they'll help you get what you want. But your first response is to help people get what they want. How do I know what you want? It's because I walk slowly through the crowd. It's because I listen. It's because I ask questions. I just wrote a book. It came out last October, and it's become a bestseller in America. It's called Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. And the whole book is about asking questions. I talk about the value of questions in the book. I talk about questions I ask myself as a leader. I talk about questions I ask my team. It's, it's, it's a book about questions. And, and what I've discovered is that before leaders lead, leaders listen. And, and they discover, they find out where their people are, and then they lead them. Because Here's the difference between management and leadership. Management leads everyone the same. Management looks at people and says, I'm going to manage you the same. They, they don't take into consideration temperament, passion, dreams, motives. They just lead everybody the same. Leaders lead everyone differently because leaders know that people are going to follow for different reasons. Leaders know this. And so the leader, before they can lead well, have to find the key. And questions are the key. Questions are the key that unlocks the door to opportunity and leadership. So at level number two, one of the things that leaders do really well at level number two is those leaders listen. And they listen because they ask good questions. Now, so they listen well. Number two, they observe. They watch their people. A lot of good effective leadership and a lot of ways that you connect with people is by observation, just watching. And the reason that great leaders observe well is that they know that behavior tells you more about an individual than anything else. My, my mentor for many, many years, the greatest coach in American history, John Wooden, my leader, my mentor, for many, many years, would tell his ball players as a college coach, he'd say, don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you're going to do. Just show me. I'm, I'm going to watch. I'm going to observe. And that's exactly what he did. In fact, he said, John, he was a basketball coach. He said, John, when my players came to college that I recruited, they began to shoot better. And I said, how is that, coach? He said, it's very simple. He said, on a basketball court, he said, for two weeks, I'd watch my players shoot around the court, around the basket. And he said, every player has a spot on the floor where they shoot better than the other place on the floor. And he said, I would just observe. I would just watch. And he said, 
Maybe after a couple of weeks, I, I, I would go up to a player and I'd say, I've been watching you for a couple of weeks. And, and he said, I'd take a piece of chalk and I would literally go down on that hardwood floor and I would draw a circle. And I would say, I've watched you now for a couple of weeks. This is where you shoot better than anywhere on the floor. And I want you to know that. Because as your coach now, I'm going to design plays to get you that shot. So in a game, you can get to your spot, we'll get you the ball, and you can shoot. Because the odds are the highest, you'll do well from this spot. And then he would tell his players, don't shoot anywhere else. You're not that good. In fact, if you shoot out of your position or out of your spot, look over at the bench. And I'm going to be saying, come over and sit beside me. You're not going to play anymore. Now, here's what leaders do. Leaders observe their team because they want to place them in a position for success. So they're constantly asking themselves as leaders, where is the best place for me to put them in the organization that they are going to prosper and do well? Because if I could put them in their best place, it's going to be best for the company. That's, that's what Jim Collins teaches all the time. You know, get your people on the bus, put them on the right seat of the bus. That's what you do. So at level number two, leaders observe their people well, they listen to their people well, and there's one other thing that they do. They serve their people well. Level two leaders understand the value of serving. A level one leader doesn't understand this. A level one leader, excuse me, I thought the levels were there. A level, a level one leader, a level one leader believes that people should serve him or serve her. A level two leader has a whole different way of thinking. When, when, the reason I, I, I use permission here is because People give you permission to lead them. Why do they give you permission to lead them? Because you relate with them, and you connect with them, and they like you, and you like them, and you, and you connect together. Now, it's at this level that you began to serve the people. You say, well, wait a minute, John. I'm the leader. Doesn't matter. I have four companies. In fact, Mark Cole, who is the CEO of all four companies, is with me on this trip. And, and we have presidents of each company, but, but I want to talk just to one person and basically lead through Mark. And so he's the CEO of all four of my companies. And, and, and he understands, I understand, this whole issue of connecting with people and, and, and relationships. So when I'm talking to Mark with, uh, now, together or, or whether it's on the phone, doesn't matter. When we talk every day, I have a question to ask him every day. Mark, how can I serve you? What, what can I do to help you? Because you're in, the, you're in this daily. What, what can I do to make it easier and better for you? Now, some of our companies, most of our companies are in Atlanta, Georgia. And, and if I'm in Atlanta, Maybe my wife and I are at a restaurant. I'll have people come up to me sometimes and introduce themselves, and they'll say, Mr. Maxwell, uh, I, I just got hired by one of your companies. I work for you. And whenever they tell me they work for me, I smile and I stop and say, no, no. First of all, don't call me Mr. Maxwell. Call me John. I'm your friend. And, and you don't work for me. Nobody works for me. I, I don't have slaves. You work with me. I work with you. You help me, I help you. We don't care about titles. We don't care about positions. We care about exceeding expectations and being successful. We, we care about production. And, and so I just want you to know we work together. I, I, I'm not over you. I'm beside you. And that's leadership. And that's level two. Level two connects with the people, relates to the people, and they bring the people along with them. Now, the third level of leadership, and I'm just going to give this to you, and then I'm done. Yeah. Prayer time, so they have a hard stop at seven. I just 
Okay. This is Mark Cole, my CEO. Give him a hand. I told you I served him, didn't I? He just told me it was 7 o'clock and it was time for me to shut up. And so when you come back from the 7 o'clock break, I'll give you level number three. Let me ask you a question. Are you learning something? Yes. Huh? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm learning something. Go ahead and tell them that. <laughs> Look right back and say, not enough yet. Not enough yet. Not a okay. You're dismissed. We'll come back after the break, and I'll, and, and I'll continue teaching. Thank you. You're a beautiful audience. Thank you very much.